all ate and were satisfied. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. It is Luke chapter 9, verses 11b to 17. At that time, Jesus spoke to the crowds of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the villages and country round about, to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a lonely place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit in companies about 50 each. And they did so, and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed, the, and, blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were satisfied. And they took up what was left over, twelve baskets of broken pieces. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, fellow believers. This day, the church gives us an opportunity to celebrate quite an important festivity and this solemnity, the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, comes immediately after the solemnity of the Holy Trinity because they are intimately connected. When we look at the historical development of this feast, we are told that this feast traces her origins from a place called Liège in France, I suppose, around 1246. That is the year 1246 AD, when the bishop Robert de Torote ordered that this festivity be celebrated within his diocese. During those years, the bishops were very powerful and they could make edicts or pronouncements that bound the people in their dioceses and beyond. But this man, the holy man of God, was requested by a woman, and that's why I feel that this solemnity has a feminine dimension of the celebrations within the church. This I consider it to be a feminine solemnity within the church. A woman, Juliana, who was born in Belgium in 1191 and has a, had a sister called Agnes, they were orphaned early in their life and they were put under the care of the Augustinian sisters where later on Juliana was to become a nun. Along his experiences as a nun or the modern day sister, if maybe the word nun could be a little bit hard for some of us, she started having what we can call mystical visions, and he was having this during the Eucharistic adoration, and this began when he had an age of 16 years. Along the adoration, she could see the bright light of the full moon, yet within it there were dark stripes across it. And with time, the Lord revealed to her, some times later, that the full moon was the figure of the church, the life of the Church of Christ, while the stripes of darkness represented some of the difficulties that were to be in the church in the past, present, and the future. 
And the Christ revealed to her that this, these problems could be addressed through the liturgical feast dedicated to the adoration of the most blessed Holy Eucharist. She kept this secret to herself for 20 years, something that is unusual because the women are announcers. Once there is something, they go out talking about it. But this young girl of 16 had to keep it a secret for more than 20 years of what she had seen in a vision and what Christ had revealed of her or to her. When the time was ripe, she went and talked to the bishop of Ridge, Liege, the bishop Lobert of Torote, and she talked about that need of having a feast dedicated to the adoration of the most blessed sacrament or the most blessed Eucharist. The bishop had his initial hesitations, but later accepted that this festivity be observed within his diocese, and let alone the bishops in the neighboring dioceses took it up and eventually spread throughout the world to what it is today. But this was not without some drawbacks. When this feast was announced, some clergy, being men and, and as they are, and some sisters, and especially the superior of Juliana, they conspired against her, and eventually she was sent out of the convent. She countered this criticism and opposition that had started increasing against her with a lot of faith, virtue, and zeal as she was spreading this devotion to the most blessed sacrament. This woman, Juliana, died in 1258 before the exposed blessed sacrament. This bishop, who had instituted this feast of Corpus Christi in Liege, was later on to be elected the Pope, and he took the name Pope Urban IV. In 1264, the Pope Urban IV instituted the feast of Corpus Christi as a universal feast for the whole church, and later on validated the mystical visions of Juliana as authentic, and that is how he rehabilitated this woman who had been sent out of the convent and later on was to become a saint. Concerning this feast, the Pope said, Although the Eucharist is celebrated solemnly every day, we deem it fitting that at least once in a year this feast be celebrated with greater honor and solemn commemoration. The Pope Urban asked St. Thomas of Aquinas, a great theologian, to compose the text for liturgical office of this new feast. Some of the texts that we still use up to today that he composed include the great song that you know, Pange Lingua, and among the stanzas are the tantu, Tantum Ergo Sacramentum, Sacramenti Kubwahi, that we normally use when there is an adoration. Pope Benedict XVI once wrote about these texts. He says, they are masterpieces still in use in the church today in which theology and poetry are fused. These texts pluck at the heart strings in the expression of praise and gratitude to the most holy sacrament while the mind penetrating the mystery in wonder recognizes recognizes in the Eucharist the living and the real presence of Jesus. Going back to this woman, who is the brainchild of this feast, who gave birth to it and encouraged the bishop of the area, and later on the Pope, Saint Juliana, she later on became a saint, suffered, along, along, suffered a lot along the conception of this feast and its birth, just like Saint Faustina, suffered through the birth of the Feast of the Divine Mercy. Quite often, around the Eucharist, there are a lot of opposition, and when you read John chapter 6, when Jesus started talking about the, sac the, the body, his body being offered for the life of many, even Jesus, Judas departed. 
around the Eucharist are so many controversies, and even in Christendom, there are more than 254 definitions or understanding of this that we call the body and blood of Christ. In one of her diaries, St. Juliana, of St. Juliana, we read, All the good that is in me is due to the Holy Communion. I owe everything to it. I feel that the holy fire has transformed me completely. Oh, how happy I am to be a dwelling place for you, O oh Lord. My heart is a temple in which you dwell continually. This diary was seen around the year 1392. When we look at this great solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, we can look at it from various widows or ventilations, but because we may not exhaust everything today. We are just going to pick a few. We may decide to look at this solemnity from the perspective of the Trinity. Because as we shall hear during the moment of consecration, we shall hear the priest saying, And so, Father, send for the Holy Spirit that he may come upon these gifts. They may become for us the body and blood of Christ. The Father who is God the Father will send the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, so that the gifts may be transformed into the second person of the Trinity. It can also be called Christological. It has a Christological dimension because being the body and blood of Christ, it has its Christological dimension. It has its pneumatological dimension in that the Holy Spirit that they call pneuma the Pentecostal dimension, as the Holy Spirit comes on the gifts, it also comes on the believers so that they may be prepared, so that they may be purified in order to receive Christ. It also has a missionary dimension because it is within the Eucharist that the church is born and the church creates the Eucharist for her mission. In order to spread the gospel, the evangelical, the evangelical dimension, because it is well situated in the Bible, it has a missionary dimension and an evangelical dimension too. We have heard Paul saying that he received it as a tradition. It is within the tradition that the Eucharist is celebrated, and it was first celebrated by Jesus and with the apostles. We can talk of it as apostolic. And when Jesus was going with the disciples to, the, to a mouse, where we read the passage of the broken brothers, the broken word, and the broken bread, it has a visionary dimension because it is at the moment Jesus broke the bread that their eyes were opened. It also animates the heart. They say, while in our hearts burning along the way. It also has a um, sacrificial dimension, the salvific dimension, and also the redemptive dimension. Even in deliverance, the real deliverance is done within the context of Eucharistic adoration. But because we cannot look at all these dimensions for the moment, we may ask ourselves, but what is the Eucharist? Or if we correct ourselves, we may ask again, who is the Eucharist? We may use the question, what is the Eucharist? Or we may ask, who is the Eucharist? And the response will be simple. The Eucharist is Jesus himself. The Eucharist is a terminology in Greek and etymologically, or if you are to explain this, the word Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharistein, and Eucharistein would imply that acceptable response of gratitude from a person who has found a favor from another by after receiving a gift. That is a holy exchange of gratitude from a gift that has been received. That is, it is an acceptable response of gratitude from one who has found a favor of receiving a gift from another. When we apply this word, the Eucharist, to Jesus, it will signify his act of giving thanks to the Father before his passion, an event, a passion event at Last Supper. And he gives this gratitude to his father because he has accepted that he becomes the savior of the world and his father will be with him. Within the church context or within the church, the Eucharist signifies the sacramental, sacramental meal 
celebrated to reenact the Paschal mysteries of Jesus. It is a liturgical celebration and reenactment celebrating as though it is happening here and now our Calvary, our Golgotha, our upper room where the Eucharist was first celebrated is celebrated in the here and now again every day of our lives. As long as the Eucharist is celebrated, Jesus becomes present in our midst. He who is Emmanuel is prolonged. His presence is prolonged in our midst. We celebrate it in the church as we thank God for what he did for us in the past, what he is doing in the present, and what he will do in the future. Within the Eucharist, we have the PPF, the past, the present, and the future, and we technically call this anamnesis. Anamnesis is that celebration of the past, the present, and the future as they are one and the same thing. Because with the celebration of the Eucharist, we make God present on the altar, he who is in the eternal now. In the Eucharistic celebration, the, ch uh, the church, through the presiding priest, calls down the Holy Spirit in an act that we call epiclesis to come upon the Eucharistic species of bread and wine to make them into the body and blood of Christ. In another way, the experience of Annunciation of Ejo Gabriel to the womb of Mary happens in the here and now, and there is a repetition of an incarnation in a new way. Just like the Christmas event, we have a new Christmas event happening on the altar because Jesus is born for us on the altar through the action of the priest. We can talk of the incarnational dimension of the Eucharist at the celebration. Besides, the same spirit that is descending upon the sacred species also comes to the church to affirm the church as the mystical body of Christ. And this will make the Eucharist to be understood as the source and the summit, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega of the Christian life, which is, at the, which is the greatest treasure that Jesus ever left to his church. The church also designates the Eucharist with a salvific value since Jesus works in it and through it in order to nourish the church as the mystical body. We always say without contradiction that the church makes the Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. There is the reciprocity between the church, the believing community, in the person of the priest who works in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, he makes the Eucharist, and it is when we are nourished by this Eucharist that the church is made. And that is why St. Augustine was fond of saying, when giving communion, he would say, receive, become what you receive, the body of Christ, for you are the body of Christ. When he was giving communion, he would tell you, become what you receive, the body of Christ, for you are the body of Christ. That is, there is a connection between the Eucharist as the body of Christ and we the believers as the mystical body of Christ and in it is pegged a salvific dimension. The concept of Eucharist and thanksgiving goes back to the Jewish act of blessing God that they call Beraka. Beraka is the Hebrew word for Swahili Baraka. Now for this, they did because of their gratitude to God for, their might, for his mighty deeds in their lives, particularly the experience of Exodus and how God walked with them. In the Old Testament, we have a lot of allusions to what we now call the Eucharist. In its sacrificial nature, we could see a prototype or a figure or something that is fundamental in the animal that was slaughtered by God in order to clothe our first parents after their fall in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.21. When God came to them and found them in the garden and asked them a geographical question, where are you? These people, because of the rebellion of sin, were not able to understand that the question was geographical and they started 
giving excuses and behind the trees they were saying si tulifanya nini na kwa sababu ya nini tukafanya tukaona tuko nini tukafanya nini you know when you are asked a geographical question by god and in that confusion you don't really want to respond they were going round and round and not responding eventually god looking at their foolishness in genesis 3:21 he offered an animal the first sacrifice whatever it was whether it was a lamb a cow a goat or a hippopotamus but an animal was slaughtered in order to cover the nakedness of the people and when we are celebrating the eucharist we can talk about the theology of food the theology of food that comes from genesis to revelation because the greatest enmity between god and man came through food and the highest act of salvation the eucharist came through food when god decided to become food for humanity but also along the way in order to save them from egypt he used the paschal lamb that they ate uh, families of 10 and later on in the in the in the desert this food took another dimension manna and in the book of isaiah chapter 25 it took an eschatological dimension chapter 25 verses 6 to 9 when they say It is on this mountain that the Lord will prepare a feast of good meat, good wine, and after then after that he will wipe the tears from their eyes and they will be saying this is the God that we waited upon this is the God we hoped for that he comes to rebuild us. These are some of the allusions that we are talking about but we cannot have said enough unless we mention until we mention the acceptable sacrifice of Abel that is interpolated to contain a sacramental dimension especially if we look at the dimension of shedding the blood that pleads with god until justice is done and this will be later on accomplished in the paschal mysteries we let us see this continued notion of the offering dimension or the thanksgiving dimension when The lamb is substituted for Isaac in Genesis 22 verses 12 to 13 and this is a prefigurement of Jesus himself it is further anticipated in the Melchizedek's offertory of the bread and wine that was received as tithe from Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 14 that forms part of our first reading today that we are going to consider a little later the eucharist is rooted in the great salvific event of the jewish passover in which they commemorate the great actions of god of their liberation from slavery in egypt in exodus 12:14 this became for them an annual feast through which they lived in the here and now the experience of their ancestors at the level of memoria that is referred in hebrew as zekaron zekaron or memoria is making present something of the past that does not end in the present but continues to the future they call it zekaron accordingly there is a jewish custom where the lamb without blemish was slaughtered in the annual passover meal to remind them that they were a covenantal people we also celebrate the eucharist to remind us that we are a covenantal people who entered into this covenant of relationship with god on the day of our baptism there seems also to be a relationship between the eucharist and the manna that the jews were fed with in the desert on their way to the promised land and this is why on their journey to the promised land we too on our promised land to heaven we take eucharist as a form of viaticum food for the journey to accompany us so that it may strengthen us and our decisions and our resolve along the way if we were to inflate this further we can associate it to the food that was promised to the jews as they were moving through the desert from babylon to Israel back to the promised land after the years of suffering in the christian context the eucharist or the last supper signifies a transition that entails change and continuity the last supper or the eucharist has in itself something that we can call a change from the old testament vision of 
salvation to a continuity, to something new, because Jesus enters our human history as God made man. Therefore, he brings something new, though picking something that was there in the old. The traditional Passover meal now becomes an offering and a sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to signify revelation for all people from the, the captivity of sin. The celebration of the Last Supper took the form of ordinary Jewish meal of thanksgiving and praise to God. And that is why Jesus, in that even, on that evening, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples. Then, in a similar way, took the cup full of wine, raised it in gratitude, thanking God, blessing it, gave it, and made it a new covenant. It, however, embraces a sacrificial dimension when now Jesus takes the bread and stocks of it as his body to be broken and the wine to be shed as his blood. He even links it to the eternal covenant sealed at Sinai in Exodus 24 verses 8. The bread and the wine become a new form of incarnation of God anticipated by the bread of presence that was reserved to be consumed by the priest of the temple that Mark makes a reference in Mark chapter 2, verses 26, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, 21, verses 1 to 6, when Abiathar the high priest gave the bread of presence to David and the soldiers when they were hungry. There are also various names that can be used for the Eucharist today that include the Holy Communion, other people will talk of the Mass. Other people talk of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the Paschal Mysteries, the Holy Mysteries of the Divine Liturgy, the Sacrament of the Altar, the Most Blessed Sacrament, and the Lord's Supper, among many others. St. Paul, on, on his part, uses the word Eucharist in the Corinthian context with the implication of participation, communion, sharing, fellowship, and this is what he refers when he says, the cup of blessings we bless, is it not the communion of the body of Christ, the bread of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 16. It bears an es eschatological sign, that is, something of the preparation for the second coming of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, uh, 20, 11, 26, when we says that as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. After his resurrection, Jesus presided over the breaking of the bread among his frustrated disciples in Luke chapter 24, verses 30 to 31, that I call the passage of the broken brothers, the broken word, and the broken bread. At the shores of the lake Genezareth, after the great catch of fish in John 21, verses 13, he makes a Eucharistic gesture when he feeds the children who are hungry and who had struggled through the whole night. He breaks the bread to celebrate it with them. Today, the Eucharistic celebration involves a sacram the sacramental pieces of bread and wine and nothing else for communion and adoration. When we turn to the readings of the day, we find in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, Melchizedek is presented as a priest of El Aeon, the Most High, the priest of the Most High God, who was the highest of the Canaanite pantheon. When you look at the, Greek, uh, the, the, the Canaanite gods, the highest of all the Canaanite gods, Babalao, was called El Aeon, and Melchizedek, the priest, was a representative of this god. Melchizedek is also presented as the king of Salem, and he gives honor to this, ma to this deity called El, the Most High, and also blesses Abraham when he receives a blessing, when he receives 10% of his uh, bu uh, bute, or what he had taken from 
the enemies of Lord. He set out a triumphant banquet to celebrate Abraham after his return from a victorious march against the enemies of Lot. God had promised Abraham, Abraham that he would bless all those who bless Abraham. And when he gives to Melchizedek 10% of the spoil, he is offered a, a Eucharistic, a prefigure of the Eucharist is celebrated because bread and wine is offered in gratitude to God as we had in our first reading. Here we find the sacrifice of the fruits of the garden, bread and wine, the fruits of a farmer, legitimizing the offering of Cain. Now when you look at the offering of the two brothers, Cain and Abel, Abel offered an animal, a representative of the uh, pastoralists, and Cain, who offered the fruit of his garden, a representative of the farmers, apparently seemed rejected, but with the offering of the bread and wine, the fruit of the garden, the farmer, there is legitimization of the sacrifice of Cain. In this sacrifice of the most blessed body and blood of Christ, the Eucharist, who is also at the same time the Lamb of God, lies the perfection of all sacrifices that are possible in history. In his offering, he absorbs the offering of the Sirius through the wheat, the offerings of the Canaanites. Many communities, including our African communities, were offering drinks and libation, could be wine or beer, to their deities. And with the wine, the fruit of the vine, Jesus absorbed the sacrifice of all the farmers, all the communities that were offering liquids and libation. With the animal sacrifice, when he calls himself the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He, he becomes now the great animal of sacrifice and he does reparation for all the other animals of sacrifices. He is also the firstborn of all creation, the first fruit of Mary and Joseph, the firstborn of God here on earth. And therefore, as the firstborns were offered to the deities in order to bless their uterus, the fruit of their womb, Jesus, who is the firstborn, offers himself to God and takes reparation for all the children, all the human beings who had been immolated as sacrifices to the deities, especially to Shemosh, the god of Canaan, Jesus now, the human offering, takes all the possible human offertories and among some communities where even they were making the representatives of the deities and the literal deities were being offered to the great deities, Jesus, as God-man, offers his sacrifice and makes it divine. So through him we can say that the sacrifice of the most blessed body and blood of Christ are all aspirations of humankind to meet the deities, where they offer serious, we offer wheat. Where they offered liquids, we, we offer the drink, the wine. Where they offered the animals of sacrifice, we offer Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, as we shall say, Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. That Lamb of God, who is that bread, the connection between the work of the farmer, the agriculturalist, and the pastoralist, because how it turns from the bread to become an animal of sacrifice is a mystery that I'm not apt to explain this evening. And it's also the sacrifice of, like the communities which were offering the, the lesser deities to the greater deity, Jesus, God made man, offers himself to the Father, and it becomes the deity offered to deity. Only Melchizedek and Jesus held the office of the priest and the king, as we have read in Genesis 14, 18. The priesthood of Melchizedek and the, the priesthood of Jesus are similar, which is different from the Levitical priesthood that was hereditary. The Catholic priests today who follow the order of Melchizedek, whose priesthood is that of Jesus, is different from the priesthood of the Levites. We read that in uh, Hebrews 6, 19 and John 1, 49. Melchizedek and Jesus have no beginning and the beginning of their days and their end. 
When we read Hebrews 7, 3, we hear that no one knows where he had come from and no one knows where he went. They are described as having no other father. Jesus had only a guardian or a foster father here on earth, Joseph, but his father was in heaven. The mother was here on earth, but for Melchizedek, his origins and destinies were not known. They had no other father in Hebrews 7, 3 and Matthew 1, 18. Melchizedek brings bread and wine out to Abram, even as Jesus brought bread and wine to his disciples at the first communion. Genesis 14, verse 18, and Luke 22, 19 to 20. The priestly office of Melchizedek is higher than that of Levitical priesthood, which is similar to that of Jesus. Now, when we turn to the second reading, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, we hear of the broken bread, that is the broken body of Christ, to be brought about the healing of broken bodies of those who commune. The biological body of Jesus was broken and was bruised with the nails, with the stripes and the bruises of the whip, and the spear that thrust through his side and the thorns that were on his head. So we are talking of a broken body, the broken biological body. And in order to keep memory of this, that is why the priest will break the body. And at that point of commingling, because the sacrifice that we offer, the Eucharist, is always a dead sacrifice until that point of commingling, Commingling is when the priest breaks the bread and puts it in the wine that now have been con consecrated to become the body and blood of Christ. When the body is alone and the blood alone, the animal is dead. It gets life at that point of commingling. When the priest puts that small speck of something, of the bread into the wine, of the body of Christ into the blood of Christ, that is when the sacrifice of Christ becomes alive. Because it is a repetition of his death now, we make him reason at that point, and what we do always is what Jesus did those times, and that makes it the best prayer that we can offer for the living and for the dead. And like Jesus in 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22, went among the dead and preached to them for their conversion and resurrection, so also at that point of mercy, Jesus also goes to meet the dead. Because what he did, we do is what happened in Golgotha, Calvary. It happens in the here and now of all places at all times. Every moment we celebrate the Eucharist. There is a cup that represents his blood, the blood that would be spilled as being beaten and crucified. And then there is the body and blood of Christ that, that reminds us of the crucifixion. It stands for the present covenant. When we look at the past, we look at a Jesus crucified, a Jesus who remains on the cross until the ends of the earth. He cries on the cross. There is a man hanging on the cross, and Jesus cannot be removed from the cross. He remains there in the posture of a man in prayer. Like Moses was praying, and Joshua later on would pray for the triumph of the Israelites, a man in the posture of prayer is Jesus hanging on the cross and he offers that sacrifice for us till the last man is saved. The sacrifice of Christ is a sacrifice in the past, a sacrifice in the present, and a sacrifice in the future. In its present form of the covenant we hear, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Jesus talks of the Eucharist as the new covenant meal being enjoyed together. It is a meal in the present. And this happens shortly before he is betrayed by Judas and arrested by the authority and crucified by the lawless people. The Eucharist is also a meal. We have said that our enmity with God came from unnecessary hunger of that forbidden fruit. When our first parents decided to eat the forbidden fruit, that brought about emptiness 
it brought about an enmity with God, and it can never be healed until God wills himself to become male, to become food for us. And at that point, God in Jesus becomes food, the bread and wine, body and blood of Christ. Then whoever comes to the Eucharistic meal and does the not that was done by Adam and Eve by eating the forbidden fruit, that which was the other gratony, the hunger for other food, now is reparated by God. The reparation that he does is through Eucharist. God becomes food for man who is hungry, who is greedy for other food. Once he becomes food for us, we eat and we shall not die. He who eats his body will not die. He is the bread of life that we sing. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes on me shall not die. I told you that I am a singer in the bathroom. The moment you put a bathroom next year and the water will be showering, I'll be able to sing. I'm a choir member of the bathroom. Now, if Jesus presents him as food to be eaten that gives immortality, it is a reparation of that food that was eaten by our first parents in the Garden of Eden, and it brought about all the disasters that followed. And this food does the anticlimax of it. There is the thesis, the antithesis, the, the antithesis, and the synthesis. Jesus comes now as a reparation of what had been done by our first parents. It happens shortly before he is betrayed by Judas, arrested by authority, and crucified by these lawless people. It is a meal that commemorates the deliverance from Egypt, and it is celebrated uh, like they celebrated the plagues, the, 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 the ten plagues. The last one was the death of the firstborns. But when they slaughtered this animal, and they were told to sprinkle the blood on the lintels of the house, the angel came and did what is called the Passover. Meaning that we who also eat the body and blood of Christ, through our lips that are the lentils of the house where he comes to indwell, that blood, when it is touched by our lips, the angel of destruction, when he comes and sees that our lintels are marked. And this is when we eat worthy. Probably if we read beyond verse 27, 28, 29, 30, and 32, we could have seen that there are some consequences of eating the body of Christ worthy, all unworthy. This meal reminds them that there was a deliverance and some of the children died. It is a new Passover. And we can see some similarities between the old Passover and the new Passover. That is, the old covenant meant deliverance from the Egyptian slavery and established the people of God as a new community, the Israelites. But this new sacrament, the new covenant that is a sacrament, delivers the people from sin and hastens the kingdom of God. The old covenant, we have the spilled blood of the unblemished lamb, and in the new covenant, we have the spilled blood of the Lamb of God. The old covenant was presided by Moses. The new covenant is presided over by the new Moses, Jesus Christ. The old covenant was celebrated in the Passover meal. The new Passover, the new covenant is, is celebrated as a meal to be celebrated at the Lord's Supper. When we look at this meal, in the future, we have talked of it as crucifixion in the past, the celebration of the new covenant in the present, and now in the future, it anticipates the eschatology, the second coming of the Lord. Because we read, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are proclaiming his death and resurrection until he comes in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. We look at the, the future with hope. We anticipate our salvation with hope because by the celebration, we announce his death and resurrection. The Lord's Supper for us is not a mourning of his death, but a celebration of the life of his resurrection and the life that he will give us beyond. There is a past event, the crucifixion, the present, which is the raising of the cup in the new covenant, and the future, as we celebrate him, we announce his death and resurrection until he comes again. There are some events as we look at what is happening in this 
uh, celebration, we are told that he took bread. And we can look at the Eucharist and we, the Christians as Eucharistic persons, we are told that he took bread. From the tradition that Paul received from the apostles, he is told that on that night, Jesus took bread. There are five events. There is the taking of the bread. When you take something, you set it apart. And we Christians who are Eucharistic persons, we are set apart. We are consecrated. Through baptism, we are set apart, we are consecrated, we are taken. And when we are taken, we accept ourselves to be taken so that the, the Lord can work with us. Ilia Tupange, since we are not the, com the community of the Tupanguingui, we are the community that is taken, we are people who are taken. As he took bread, we also accept to be taken. After taking it, he raised it. When we were taken through baptism, we were raised to the status of the children of God. We are consecrated and called to holiness. He raised the bread. He took it. He raised it. We are raised people. When we have been raised, we are somewhere between the world and the heavens. We are in the world and not of the world. We are heavenly. We are not worldly, though in the world, because we have been raised as this bread that is raised. He gave thanks. The third aspect is, is giving thanks. For us who are transformed by baptism, we have been made the vessels of God's gratitude. As we move, we are an act of gratitude. We are an act of thanksgiving, whatever we are. Later on, after taking it, setting it apart, raising it, glorifying it, because we are glorified as the image of God renewed through the redemptive action of Christ, Thanksgiving is done. We are vessels of gratitude. Then the Lord broke it. It is broken. The broken bread resembles the Christians who cannot always want to be intact. We have to break ourselves and allow God to break us so that we can be available for others in the other action of distribution. And this distribution is about nourishing. And this is how the Eucharist is so much close to the sacrament of marriage. I hear because I don't know that when you people who are married, you cross the marriage, uh, the, the, the door to the bedroom, and when you go to this sacrifice of the Eucharist, this is when you offer your body and you say, this is my body offered for you. Break me, crush me, eat me. And the woman and the husband together, they can have that Eucharistic celebration on their marital bed. And it has been raised to a sacrament, just like the priest on this bed called the altar, where Jesus sleeps in order to liberate the world and recreate the world. You also, on, their, on your marriage beds, recreate and the images of God through that Eucharistic gesture. This is my body offered for you. Crush me. Eat me, break me. Now we turn to the gospel. Luke chapter 9, verses 11 to 17. This gospel, and that, are we together? And this is why, and this is why people who enter into marriage without the sacrament are thieves. Because you are taking such a sacred thing of taking a body that you have stolen, and you want to crush it and, <laughs> and, break, it, and break it every day without uh, that Eucharistic gesture. Yes, without uh, that Eucharistic gesture that uh, the priest on this bed, the altar. And that's why when the priest enters the church, the first thing he does is to kiss this bed of sacrifice. This bed of sacrifice is the altar. That connection with his is sweetie, Jesus here. Mwah. And you on the other side. Now, we can return to Luke chapter 9, verses 11 to 17. The gospel today is talking about three things. The people in need, the disciples who are not able to respond to their needs, and the God of providence. There are three things in our gospel today. The people in need who are hungry and who look like sheep without shepherd, we have the disciples who are incapable or unable to supply for their needs, and then we have the providence of Jesus, a multitude of people in need. Now, we, that's the first part. We begin with the people in need, and we are the people in need. 
we understand that without Jesus, we suffer inadequacy. Without Jesus, we are blind. Without Jesus, we are deaf. Without Jesus, we are lame. Without Jesus, we are faced by people who die in our midst, and we have people dying every day. We are in need of food. And these people had stayed for a long time, and they were in need of food. The few food sometimes, and even when we look at the Garden of Eden, made us lose friendship with God. But God eventually would become food, and this is a preparation. When Jesus is multiplying the bread, it is a form of a Eucharistic sacrifice and celebration in order to bring back people to salvation. In the desert, there was nothing to eat. The desert is a place of shortage. But when Jesus is with them in the desert, there is abundance. There is superfluity. There is a lot. There is abundance. The greatest need was spiritual. When he looked at them, they were like sheep without shepherd. And though the disciples were fatigued, they were tired, he, they could not stop to rest until these people were fed. So he begins by teaching them. Jesus could as well heal them and feed them. But he understood that without food, they are going to sin more. Just like our first parents, when they were hungry of the forbidden fruit, read out of their gratin, they desired it. It was good for the eyes, pleasing for the eyes and good for food. He knew that these people, without food, they are going to sin. He taught them because first, their first hunger was through spiritual ignorance. Before feeding them, he teaches them. Before he gives the physical nourishment, there is the spiritual nourishment. Just like we have the two tables, the table of the word of God where the word of God is broken and the table of the Eucharist where the bread is broken. Jesus, as though he was celebrating the Mass, he begins by spiritual nourishment, breaking the word of God, the liturgy of the word, and then there is the liturgy of the Eucharist when he receives that bread and fish and breaks them. That is the Eucharistic liturgy. The second part of this gospel is where the disciples are not able to supply for the needs of the, the, those people who are being taught by Jesus. When Jesus welcomes them in, chap in chapter 9, verses 11, the disciples suggest that they be sent away. And this is quite often our reaction. When the people come to the church and they are looking for some help, some of us, like the disciples say, we send them out there to the politician. We send them out there to those who have excess. We send them out there. The disciples suggest that they be sent away. But Jesus sends them back to their conscience and tells them, Give them something to eat. We have a responsibility when the people are hungry. In Mark 9, 13, Jesus did not call manna from heaven. He had an ability. He is God. He could have done that, but he relies on what they have. What do you have? When God does miracles, he begins with what we have. The question will always be, what do you have? What is this that we can present to God? This boy that is not mentioned in Mark, gave the five loaves of bread and two fish, gave what he had, and that becomes the literal that God uses to, multi to multiply. He relied on somebody's gener generosity. That is, the principle of multiplication depends on the principle of generosity. If we have something to be broken and to be multiplied, it is to be founded upon the principle of generosity. When this boy became generous with his lunchbox, it became multiplied so that it can feed thousands of people. That which was to be taken to, to the loose after some minutes now becomes an object of preaching for thousands and thousands of years. That which was temporal becomes eternal. He could have prophesied, Jesus could have prophesied for bread to jump from what the pers one person's heart to another, jump like manna from heaven and come upon their heads or come into their baskets, but he still relied on people. He said, Tell, have them sit, also distribute to them. He needed servants. And here we talk about the principle of availability that is a precondition of the principle of service. The availability of the disciples becomes a principle of availability that helps in the principle of service. In order for us to experience God and his richness, there must be the principle of generosity that produces the principle of multiplication and the principle of availability that gives way to the principle of service. 
These people were tired. The disciples were tired. We have heard that they came and they wanted some rest. They were also hungry because people were moving in and out. They themselves had not um, eaten something. And Jesus uses that principle of fatigue for service. Jesus does not go to the idle people. Jesus works, to the busy, uh, works with the, the busy, busy people because those who are busy will have some time. It is not because we have superfluous time that God will use us, but he uses those who are busy because they will have time for him. They were coming and going. So these people do not have even time to eat, but in the shortage of their time, they offered it to Jesus. In their tired bodies, they offered it to God. Jesus uses people who are made of their insufficiency, yet willing to share the little they have. And these disciples seem sarcastic or ironical when they say, where can we buy this food enough for these people? In a desolate place, there is no time because these people are coming in and going out. There are no resources because it is in the desert. They have no energy because they are tired. They are also hungry and there are no opportunities. And when they hit the rock bottom in the ocean, Jesus then comes up with the providence. Jesus gives out the best when we give all. Irrespective of how literal or insignificant it is, he receives it multiplies it and gives it back to us. Just like after our time of Sadaka, we offer it to God and we raise it up to God and we say, receive it on your holy altar with the Eucharistic number one, the Eucharistic prayer number one. We ask that God sends his angel upon the altar, takes the gifts to God. Once they are blessed and sanctified for our case, they are broken and brought and distributed. That is, however insignificant it is, when we offer this sacrifice to God, when we admit our insignificance, when we understand how literal we are before God and we offer it, God takes it and multiplies it and makes it give for us. We offer our brokenness for him that he may use it voluntarily. The disciples were tired. They were without time. They had no energy left. They were hungry. There were no resources for them in the desert. There were also not opportunities for them to buy because the nearest town was a little bit far because of desolation. But the least they had given by this boy, the Lord take, took it. And again, we go back to the same event of the second reading. Jesus takes, he blesses. With God's blessing, there is the multiplication. He breaks. I know with breaking sometimes, the breaking comes from the most intimate person or the close person. Many of the people who break our hearts, many people who break the hearts of the bishops are the priests. And many people who break the hearts of the priests are their bishops. Some other times it is the Christians that they serve every day who break their heart. Now this breaking means that we cannot be able to serve God without breaking and making ourselves ready to be broken. Nothing is offered to God and received is offered to others without breaking. It has to change form. That is why after this bread is received, it has to be broken so that it can change the form to be given. He cannot receive it whole and give it whole. That is why you cannot offer your life as a girl whole as you are and remain that without being broken to become a mother, to become a wife. You have to be broken in order to become a mother, like a garden that has to be tilled, that has to be broken. And planted. The same Eucharistic gesture has to be broken. And what is received? The man has to be broken in order to stop being a gentleman, to become a man, a father. The woman has to be broken in order to become not a girl again, but to become a mother, a wife. The Lord does not accept the wholeness that we offer, but he wants that brokenness, the humility. Because with the wholeness, sometimes we are proud. Then he reorders the redistribution. He receives to give away. Then he orders the gathering of the leftovers. There is no waste. There are 12 full baskets. Everyone had enough and the leftovers are conserved. They are, they are taken because they are in the midst of the good shepherd and he is there with them. They do not go empty hearted. Now, when we look at that Eucharist as we said that they are the two wings, the Eucharist is like a gigantic bird. There is Eucharist for communion that we have been talking about, and there is communion, uh, there is Eucharist in the second dimension of adoration. And, to, and we shall see 
that uh, like this uh, gigantic bird, you see that after this Eucharistic adoration, uh, after the Eucha uh, this sacrifice of the mass, we shall have the Eucharistic adoration because these two dimensions, just like a human being has two lungs to help in the breathing, we also need the two dimensions, or the bird needs the two wings in order to fly. The Eucharist for communion and the Eucharist for adoration, God meets us in the two. The first adoration of Jesus was done in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was surprised that the disciples would not stay with him and watch and pray with him. When he was going to the cross, he says, well, when we go to the adoration, we respond to the invitation of Jesus when he cries, I thirst. When we go for adoration, we go to respond to that thirst of Jesus. We become the water that he drinks out of the love that he gives, yearning for us, calling us to his altar. When we go for adoration, we quench his thirst because he is thirsty for our souls. It helps us keep the company of the divine prisoner who comes to visit us from heaven. When we look at the tabernacle that I call the divine prison, God comes from heaven in the Eucharistic species that we preserve in the tabernacle. And when we come for adoration, we are keeping company to this divine prisoner who makes us jailbreakers. When we come with all our imprisonments to this man in the tabernacle, the divine prisoner, he breaks all our jails for us and we become the, 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 the prison breakers or the jail breakers because when we tell him what is disturbing us, he is able to do that. We come to participate for our own salvation because when we watch with him, he is undertaking the act of salvation. We have said that the Eucharist has a salvific dimension and when we come and walk with him, he helps us participate in our salvation. He helps us to be like the master. If you keep the company of the jackals, you learn how to howl. If you keep the company of the blessed sacrament, you learn to be holy. By gazing to the Jesus in the blessed sacrament, he gazes at us and he transforms us. He takes care of us. You know, if, when you look at Moses with, in front of the burning bush, when he looked at the burning bush and God was looking at him, he was not only looking at him, he was also looking at the sheep behind him. And in this way, when we come to the Eucharistic adoration, Jesus does not only take care of us. He also takes care of the, the sheep of Moses behind us that we carry. He opens the spiritual blindness and these the, the, the disciples of Emmaus that we call the broken brothers, the broken one, the bre broken bread, in adoration with Jesus in his presence, remaining in the presence of God, our spiritual eyes can be opened. He gives the warmth because we are cold without him. He ignites the fire of our hearts. Because they say, were not our hearts burning along the way as he was breaking the word, as he was narrating to us the history of salvation? It also helps us to organize our time well. When we come and we are rushing for the adoration, every time we come, the weekly adoration, the everyday adoration we do, it helps us to be available to the Lord. He who is eternal absorbs our temporality in order that we can adore him. The Eucharistic adoration makes us have a profound personal relationship with God. We are renewed in his presence. We concentrate on him and we are consumed in his, from the daily distractions. No, in the world there are so many distractions. But when we are with Jesus, he orients us and helps us to listen to him as he speaks. In the different moments of prayer, we speaks, he speaks to us, we speak to him. When, when we are praying... Jesus listens to him, to us. But when we go in his presence, he talks and we listen. Adoration helps to, pre to bring about the presence of our vocation, our marriage, and our presence of work, because we come to his mountain with all these bother we bring to him. Many people who have failed in their lives are people who have distanced themselves from the Eucharist. When Judas heard about the Eucharist and he fell away, and he could not keep the company of Jesus, he became a betrayer. And many of us who have left this, the Eucharist, our lives are not upright. It is only when we accept to come to the Eucharist and we show that fidelity of Jesus, we come so close to him. When he asks, do you also want to go away? Peter answers on our behalf. To whom do we go? And you have the, the, the word of life. There is that union, the oneness with him who is immortal, who does not die. 
But we betray him every time we abandon the Eucharist and we start dying slowly in our, in, in our spirituality. The Eucharist, as we know it, becomes medicinal and heals us from venue sin and forbids us from going into the mortal sin. In the Eucharist, we come to ask the Lord, what do we do? We fix our eyes to him, he fix eyes on us. And when we eat from him, we do not go to the, bag, uh, to the, to the garbage site to eat from there because he, who is our banquet, gives us the best. This attachment to the Eucharistic Jesus makes us ready to be sent. In his presence, he brings us to the school where we can be taught, where our love for him increases, and he helps to us to learn how to live our daily lives in his presence. This adoration helps us to have overcome our addictions. When we come to this divine prisoner and tell him, I'm suffering from alcoholism, I am suffering from pornography. I am suffering from this addiction or the other. We who are men walking in the hospital every now and then sick, we bring our addictions and Jesus heals us. The broken pieces of our lives are assembled together. He comes and makes us integral persons. He becomes the energy for all actions. We come and when our lives are stagnated and we come to him, he is there. He tells us that you are obedient vessels of divinity. Because we have made a personal encounter with him. After communing with him, he also wants us to be having this presence with him for that uh, restoration of our innocence. The innocence that is lost. We come for adoration and we tell him, Lord, we want you to walk with us. We want us that our venue sins be treated. We want to encounter you in our personal, in our personal prayer. We come to adoration so that we may not sin. You know, when we are out there, occasions of sin are everywhere. But when we come and we are imprisoned in his presence, he makes us avoid occasions of sin. He is there. We are vigilant in our spiritual life. In the presence of God, we read ourselves well. He turns the spotlight not away from us, but towards ourselves. Quite often we look at others. We don't concentrate about ourselves. We think about, about our sources. Coming to God, we think of origins, and our destiny. We come to fulfill the destiny of our master, dwelling in his presence. Can you stay with me for, a, for an hour? Our desires are purified. When we come to the blessed sacrament in adoration, the Lord who demanded his company is willing to break the grief that we have. If somebody has died, if we are suffering from this or that, and we come in the presence of Jesus, keeping vigil with him, will frustrate the tempter. Away from Jesus, we can be eaten. We are vulnerable. We are fragile. We are weak. But when we are here with him, bringing our spiritual fatigue to him, all these hours that we waste there, looking at football, entertainment, in the internet, television, the Lord is asking, can't you give the minimum? Come and we be with me. Let us have a relationship. Come to the blessed sacrament where we intercede for one another. The world is moving very fast, in the fast lane. But when we come and stop before the Eucharist, the Lord will speak heart to heart as a lover. He is revealing himself with us, and he will be having the spiritual visions that can be restored for people who no longer experience God. Try him in the blessed sacrament, and you will not be afraid again. We are welcomed to encounter him in communion and adoration. As we celebrate this great solemnity of the Corpus Christi, we are asking for the favor that comes from God to remain in his presence always. Tum sefu Christu.